Well, I thought my razor was dull until I heard his speech. And that reminds me of a story that's so dirty, I'm ashamed to think of it myself. For I have a message of great importance for everyone in the audience. I implore you, send him back to his father and brothers who are waiting for him with open arms in the penitentiary. I suggest that we give him 10 years in Leavenworth or 11 years in Twelveworth. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take five and 10 in Woolworth. Now remember, please, absolute quiet. Cut the cards. The Marx Brothers, Gracho, Chico, and Harpo, were the biggest comedy stars of their time. Irreverent, anti-establishment, unpredictable, they made Depression-era America rock with laughter. And amazingly, their humor is as influential today as it was when they made their classic films. Those are the Marx Brothers we know and love, but there's a lot more to their story. from the silver screen. That's right, folks. We're on our way. That's right, folks. But well, where do we go from here? Racho, Chico, and Harpo may have been making light of the end of their career, but the truth was the brothers had lost their enthusiasm for the film business. So in 1941, they retired the act. It wasn't the first time their career had reached a dead stop, but how only five years after the remarkable success of a night at the opera and a day at the races. How had it come to this? It all began in 19th century Germany where their maternal grandparents ran a traveling theatrical company. Levi Schoenberg was a bad magician. Fanny was a yodeling harpist. When they came to America, their daughter Minnie was 15. Seven years later, the bright, witty, and ambitious Minnie married Sam Marks. Frenchy, as everybody called him, was by most accounts a very nice man, a very good cook, but a very bad tailor. Frenchy and Minnie raised five boys, but what few know is that there was a sixth Marx brother. Chico was born after the firstborn died, and uh, his name was Manfred. Because Chico came after that, Minnie was very attached and adored him. Leonard was born in 1887. As a boy, Chico learned to hustle money in pool halls, race tracks, and bars. One quarter scotch, one quarter ice. Okay, lady, I sent him right over. Chico caused trouble from the time he was quite young. I mean, he got into gambling. He was a compulsive gambler by the time he was 12. Once while delivering a suit for his father, he lost a bet and the pants to a local hustler, so he stole Frenchy's shears and hawked them to get the pants back. His stage character, the lovable con artist, was already taking shape. It is very likely because whatever love Minnie was able to give was so directed at Chico that Chico was probably felt the most secure in himself because he's the one who wheeled and dealed jobs for them. Uh, and though probably he never cracked open a book, he was very articulate and delightful. She used to give him, you know, 50 cents a week to get piano lessons, and maybe he got to the piano teacher once out of four times because he'd gamble the 50 cents away on, on the way to the teacher. Nobody ever had played the piano like him before, and nobody's ever played it like him since. Thank you. 
Ooh. It's quite an unusual technique that he developed all by himself, you know, he worked very hard at it, but only when he had to. The only time he ever practiced at all was when he had a show to do. He left us this remarkable legacy of how he played the piano, and people probably remember him more for his piano playing than anything else. In 1888, Adolf was born. In the shadow of Chico's gregariousness, this child, who later changed his name to Arthur, and finally Harpo, became the good son. Every day he'd come home from school, he'd go by the window and he'd see the man rolling the cigars. And as he rolled the cigars, he made this remarkably hideous looking face. He couldn't help it, it was just a reaction. The man would go, and the cigar would be made. And Dad thought that was one of the best-looking men he had ever seen in his life. He developed the gookie. As a result, it became a part of his act. Having mastered the look, Hoppo would pound on the window, do a gookie, and enrage the cigar maker. So began Hoppo's not totally innocent challenging of authority figures. Hey, you're a wide guy, ain't you? Let go that club. Give me that club, you hear? Did you see that badge? He taught himself how to play the harp, uh, having no resources to go out and get lessons. He learned on the job as playing accompaniment for the brothers, and they incorporated the harp into the act. Daddy was a great ragtime pianist, and he had fun at the piano, but Harper was a really great musician, extraordinary harpist. In 1890, the famous trio was completed when Julius was born. Quiet and intellectually curious, he would frequently lock himself in the bathroom to read, stockpiling the lethal verbal arsenal that would be his trademark. Not that I care, but where is your husband? Why, he's dead. I'll bet he's just using that as an excuse. I was with him till the very end. <laughs> no wonder he passed away. I held him in my arms and kissed him. Oh, I see. Then it was murder. Will you marry me? Did he leave you any money? Answer the second question first. Even as a boy, Julius was careful with money. Many would give him five pennies to buy bread. He would get a day-old loaf for four cents and squirrel away the rest. Groucho would always equate money with security. The three Marx brothers became four in 1892 when Milton was born and five in 1901 when Herbert became the fifth Marx brother. Many's boys were raised in a poor immigrant neighborhood on the Upper East Side of New York at the turn of the century. Many's determination to see her son succeed was possibly reflective of feeling a failure in her own life and feeling that these boys had it. Driven by the ultimate stage mother, they would do anything to escape poverty. That willingness to do anything enabled them to survive the horrors of small-time vaudeville. The boys were doing so badly in school, they, except for Groucho, they were all playing hooky, that she decided to put them all into show business so they'd be in one place where she could keep an eye on them. <laughs> they started as a family singing act. First it was a three, then the four nightingales. That's Groucho looking just like Harpo with a gap-toothed smile. Many years later, Groucho remembered one of his first performances. And I walked out on the stage, and there were 60 musicians sitting out front dressed in evening clothes. I'd never seen anybody dressed in evening clothes except my father when he got married. But here were all... <laughs> here were these 60 men, and I was, I was really... I was stiff with fright, and, but uh, I bellowed this song out. I was young enough to have courage in those days. Anyhow, this is the way the chorus went. Of course, you must remember that I could sing then. Somebody, sweetheart, I want to be. Somebody's heart beating all for me. Somebody's two arms around me when I feel blue. Somebody's sweetheart, and that means you. That was it. Daddy told me that the first time Harper went on stage, he was so terrified he wet his pants on stage. Poor little boy. 
Uh, he was very sweet. I loved Harper. For the Marx Brothers, there was no glamour in vaudeville. They toured the country singing in dilapidated theaters with only distant and unrealistic dreams of success to keep them going. The Feist Boy would sing... Way down by the sad seaside, and then Gamma would sing, sat two lovers side by side, and Hopper would sing, first he sighed, and then she sighed, and then I'd sing, and then they both sighed side by side, and then we'd sing, Peasy Weezy, what's his name? Peasy Weezy, Peasy Weezy, what's his name? Chico was uh, in the same town that his brothers were in. And when he saw that they were playing, he bribed the guy in the pit who played the piano to let him stand in for him. And when his brothers saw him in the pit, they started throwing things at him, and he threw them back, and he joined the act. A major breakthrough for the brothers occurred in 1910 in, of all places, Nagadoches, Texas. They would do a show and get on a train and move to the next town and do another show. What happened is, as they were in the middle of their song, and not a very good song at that, a man runs in and says, runaway mule, runaway mule. And the audience raced out to see a runaway mule. So Groucho was just furious. Uh, when the audience finally filed back in, he made comments, comments like Nagadoshas is full of roaches. I think that was the kind of thing that they were saying. But the people thought it was funny. And then apparently dad decided in a, on the spur of the moment to dive under a rug that was on the stage and go across the stage under the rug. And Chico ran over and started shooting the piano keys and they became a comedy act as a result of this. The act flourished. In a sketch called Fun in High School, the brothers wreaked havoc in every town they played, racing up and down the aisles, improvising wildly and practically destroying the theater. Elderly man came up to see me. He must have been in his 90s. And he said, I just want you to know that the Marx Brothers were the greatest. And I know because I was there. I saw them in vaudeville. And I said, well, thank you. There were guys that came out of that era that were just fabulous, like Jack Benny and W.C. Fields. And the man said to me, they were all a breath of fresh air. But the Marx Brothers, they were a hurricane. Now listen, you're making a big mistake. Well, These fellas are very clever. They're funny fellas. And I've got a play that I've written that I'd like to explain to you. I'd like to read I'd like to read this manuscript for you. It's yeah, a one minute play, and these fellas would fit in it. They've got now, if you just come over and sit down with now. me for a minute, I'll explain yeah, the whole thing to his managers. Oh. Fun in High School featured Groucho as a stern professor, a role he would reprise twenty years later in Horse Feathers. Now then, baboons, what is a corpus? That's easy. First as a captain, then as a lieutenant, then as a corpuscle. That's fine. Why don't you bore a hole in yourself and let the sap run out? The brothers were an onstage force, but it was an act of desperation by many that gave them the push they needed. In 1914, she had the audacity to buy a full-page ad in the trade magazine, Variety. She brazenly guaranteed that the Marx Brothers would boost the box office or perform for free. It worked. And from that point on, they were booked solid on the top vaudeville circuits. She took the name of Minnie Palmer, and she became an agent. And um, when Daddy joined the act, one of the things he discovered was that in order to sell some of her acts, she'd sell the Marx Brothers cheaper. So he, very gently, because he adored Minnie, but he managed to get the reins away and become the manager. And he stayed their manager until the very end. I'm sincerely proud to, to greet you and thank you very much for coming here. Uh, Chico, I, I've been a fan of yours, may I say this, since I was about this high when I saw you in Duck Soup. Are you really brothers? Well, as far as I know. <laughs> you know, a lot of people ask me, uh, are we really brothers and can Harpo talk and how did you get your name? Is he going to make any more pictures? You know, Harpo can really talk. If you don't think he can talk, just play golf with him and let him miss a putt that big. You'll hear him talk. <laughs> How we got our names is a very interesting thing. One night, the Marx Brothers were involved in a backstage game of stud poker, and a comedian named Art Fisher was dealing. And he dealt a card to Leonard, and he stopped, and he said, wait a moment, you're always chasing the chicks, so... We're going to call you Chico. 
Chico's name came because uh, in those days, a fellow who chased girls was called a chicken chaser. I got my name when I was about 15 years of age. I, I used to chase the chickens. I still chase them. I don't catch them anymore. And I'm just waiting for a rainy day. I'm good in the mud. <laughs> and then six, he put down for Julius, who he decided to call Groucho. We used to wear a little bag that was around the neck. It was called a grouch bag. In this bag, we would keep our pennies, our marbles, piece of candy. You wore a little grouch bag around your neck with some money in it, and you never took it off when you slept, and you never took it off. And that was maybe part of the, the, the name Groucho. And I got my name from that cartoon strip. My own theory was that he really was going by his disposition. <laughs> That's mean. He wasn't always grouchy, but he was grouchy a lot. Well, Harpo got his name because, uh, obviously, he played the harp. When they were on the farm, Zeppo, who was about 14, was sitting on a fence when Daddy was walking down the road. And when he saw Daddy, he went, Hi there, Zeke. And Dad said, Hi there, Zepp. And it stuck. And Zeppo was born when the first Zeppelin came over to America. That's how he got his name. There was a freak, apparently, with Ringling Brothers Circus, and uh, the freak's name was Zippo. For some strange reason, the brothers des decided to call him Zippo, and he hated that. Uh, was, his name was Herbert, but he had uh, only that choice other, other than Zippo, so he changed it to Zeppo. And Gummo, oh, Gummo, Gummo wore uh, thick-soled shoes, gum shoes, and they called him Gummo because of the shoes, because you could never hear him coming. It would be another 10 years before those nicknames became known to the public, but whatever you called them, the Marx Brothers finally made it to the top. In 1915, they played America's premier vaudeville theater, The Palace. New York audiences fell in love, and suddenly the Marx Brothers were earning over $1,500 a week. Although Groucho was the featured player, it was Harpo, according to Variety, who stole the show. Variety declared... He is a comedian who plays the harp and doesn't talk, getting laughs from his handling of both. Hey, what do you think you are? Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know who this is? No. He's South Frankfurt. Is that the Merchant of Venus? Well, what do you want? My name is What Do You Care? My home is anywhere. People say I'm awful dumb, so I thought to you I'd come. Say, listen, what is it? Now, that? now, just a moment. Wait a minute. He might be crazy. Wait, I'll find out. You want to go on a stage? Crazy. At one time in their vaudeville act, Harpo did speak. But their act, along with his speaking, was wearing real thin, and they were having trouble getting work. And finally, one day in Chicago, Minnie convinced a theater owner to book her boys with the promise that they'd have a brand new act. So Minnie got her brother, Al Sheehan, who was one of that famous vaudeville duo, Gallagher and Sheehan, and that was their uncle, to write the script for them that night. Unfortunately, in his haste, he forgot to write any lines in for my dad, who said, okay, I'll just add lip. Well, they went ahead and they did the show, and then the following day the reviews came out and said something like, uh, Last night's bill at the Orpheum, Arthur Marks proved himself a first-rate pantomimist. However, his reputation as a co comedian was rudely shattered every time he opened his mouth to speak. And from that time on, he never spoke another word on stage. Just used the horn and the whistle. <laughs> You know, I'd be lost without a telephone. I was on the road with him. My Uncle Harper once took me piggyback across the stage, and I must say, I did love the applause. The United States entered World War I in April of 1917. Young men were being drafted by the boatload, but many was determined to keep the act together. During the First World War, Grandma read where farmers didn't have to go to war, so she bought a farm. So they went out and they bought 2,000 chickens problem was there were rats on the farm and so the rats ate the eggs every morning when their friends would come to visit to avoid the embarrassment
the Marx Brothers would go into town, buy several dozen eggs, and put them underneath the chickens. Of course, they realized that being farmers didn't work, and so they decided to at least try to enlist. Uh, most of them got deferments because of eyesight or other medical conditions. Uh, allegedly, Gummo was the, the only healthy one. It may be only a coincidence that he was the most expendable to the act. Therefore, they, they decided to offer him up to service. After Gummo enlisted, the Marx Brothers sold the chicken coops and returned to the stage. Gummo would never perform again, ultimately becoming an agent for Groucho and Harpo. Baby brother Herbert took Gummo's place in the act. He'd been palling around with some gangsters, and his entrance into show business probably kept him out of jail. For money, I'll do anything. Why don't you try me? You might as well. You might be great. Who can tell? What do you call your specialty? You mean my big sensation? I knock him cold when I pull off my Chevalier imitation. You know, Zeppo took over for Groucho. He was his understudy when Groucho got sick. And many people who had seen Zeppo work felt that Zeppo was equal to the task. Zeppo was a very funny man. Eager to prove they could be funny outside of vaudeville, the brothers set a new and ambitious course. It was a disaster. They flopped in a musical, financed their own silent movie, which was so bad it was never released, and their American-style comedy misfired during a 1922 tour of England. Then when they came home, they found they'd been blacklisted for breach of contract. They were washed up about the only positive career moment during this period followed the birth of Groucho's son, Arthur. The Marx Brothers were performing at Keith's Riverside Theater at the time, and Groucho spent a little too much time at the hospital visiting his wife and his newborn baby. And so he got back to the theater a little bit late. And our curtain music was just playing as we walked in the theater. So I didn't have time to paste this on, so I took some black grease paint and I went like this. And smeared on a grease paint mustache and eyebrows. The roar of the grease paint couldn't negate the fact that the brothers had no agent, no backers, and no show. However, one by one, they were starting families. They passed the theater and the, the Marx Brothers were playing and her girlfriend said, gee, I know a lot of actors. And mother said, well, I know one of the Marx Brothers. So she said, prove it. So mother sent a um, note backstage to Chico. And then they waited around outside the, the stage door. And Harpo came out and he said, hi, I'm Chico. And she said, no, you're not. And Grouch came out and said, hi, I'm Chico. And she said, no, you're not. And when Chico came out, he said, you're the little girl who stood me up in Pittsburgh. And they started going together. And he told her to throw away her books, that she'd learn more from him than she ever would by going to school. My father was always uh, buying with Chico to be his mother's favorite, and he wasn't ever. Chico was the favorite. So my father turned around when Chico got married and married the first available woman, and that happened to be another dancer in the act. Chico's wife was a dancer, and that's how they got married. And they really weren't meant for each other, I don't think, from the start. They weren't, They, in my opinion, never should have been married to begin with, but if they hadn't, then I wouldn't be here. So I guess I'm glad they got married. Chico was always the Navy one. He says, look, we're better than half the shows that are on Broadway. And Hopper and I were always scared. We didn't think that we could make it. He was enormously uh, optimistic about everything. That was the gambler in him. And Groucho was always pessimistic. So that when Chico came up with the idea of doing a, a Broadway show, Groucho, Groucho was terrified. He said, why should anybody go see us on Broadway? For $3.30, one for 55 cents, they can see us in vaudeville. And Chico said, because we're too good for vaudeville. <laughs> he said, we belong on Broadway. A cartoonist friend of Chico's had an idea for a new production that would make use of leftover scenery being stored near a vacant theater in Philadelphia. Together, he and Chico combined existing Marx Brothers routines with new material, making it more of a review than a traditional stage musical. I'll Say She Is opened in Philadelphia in June of 1923 and was an instant hit. They played Philly for 13 sold-out weeks before taking the show on the road for nearly a year. They arrived on Broadway in May of 1924. Minnie's dream was about to come true. It was opening night of I'll Say She Is. I was too little to go, and Minnie was being fitted for a dress for the opening night. 
She was standing on a little stool and she fell off the stool. And you know the old show business story, you know, break a leg. Well, Minnie did. Everybody was hysterical and crying and, and Minnie just went to the opening on crutches. She was indomitable. But perhaps the biggest break of the day was when another opening night was canceled and most critics came to see the Marx Brothers. With no expectations and without exception, they raved. Especially enamored was influential drama critic Alexander Wolcott, who, en route to the theater, sarcastically remarked that he was on his way to see a bunch of acrobats. Wolcott's review was one of Harpo's proudest moments, and it triggered a lifelong friendship between them. When they opened in their first show and Wolcott came to see them, the uh, program said Leonard Marx, Arthur Marx, Julius Marx, Herbert Marx. And when he was backstage, when he was being introduced to them, he heard, you know, Daddy say, hey, Grouch, you want to go out for anything? And somebody said, I don't know, Zepp, what are you doing? And Wolcott said, excuse me, what, what are you calling each other? And they said, well, those are our nicknames. He said, you have those nicknames and you're using, you know, Herbert and Julius? He said, that's ridiculous. They said, but it's not dignified. At which point, Wilcott fell on the floor laughing. But that's who changed, that's when they began to use their nicknames. How do you think? I need a drink. All right. The only surviving evidence of their Broadway yeah, debut well, is a 1931 yeah. promotional film in which the brothers recreated the opening scene, demonstrating the verbal interplay that knocked out New York audiences. I want to speak to Mr. Lee. I'm a dramatic actor. Oh, I see. I'm Mr. Lee. Well, lend an ear to me. Can you play a role? Can I play a role? Do you know who you're looking at? No. Caesar's ghost. I play any kind of a role. You will? I'll eat it up like that. I played a part in Ben Hall once. What part did you play, sir? A girl. She played the part of Ben. And you? I played her. When you go out, take a slam at the door. You're kidding me, aren't you not? Kidding, you say. I've been here all day. Now show me what you've got. I want to play a dramatic part, the kind that touches a woman's heart to make her cry for me to die. Did you ever get hit with a coconut pie? There's my argument. Restrict immigration. I think I'll recite. Let it go. All right. With our first Broadway play, it was called I'll Say She Is. That was a current expression at that time. You know, you'd say a girl would walk down the street and you'd say, boy, she's good looking. And the fellow would say, I'll say she is. Get me a brick. Here's a brick. I always carry one for this invitation. Hey, I don't know. Lay this on your head. You can't do that. You don't belong to the Bricklayers Union. The Marx Brothers were now the toasts of Broadway. They were quoted in newspaper columns, invited to parties, featured on the radio, and offered membership in private clubs. One day, so the story goes, Harper was visiting some of his new friends on the set of a silent movie. A strange thing happened. He ended up in the picture. This recently unearthed footage, long thought lost by even the most ardent Marx Brothers fans, clearly demonstrates Harpo's engaging screen presence. Even though he had only a minor role, Harpo was able to inject a bit of the anarchic spirit that would later characterize his film persona. You sure you can't move? Hardly brilliant dialogue, but it is notable as the only time in his screen career that Harpo spoke on camera. Unfortunately, the movies weren't ready for his voice, technologically speaking. Broadway demanded more Marx madness, and in December of 1925, their second smash, The Coconuts, opened. They were blessed with a musical written by Broadway legends George S. Kaufman and Irving Berlin. In the cast of that wild Florida farce was Margaret DeMont, the lady who had become Groucho's perennial foil, playing the grown-up opposite their childish antics. Years later, Groucho would proclaim she was practically the fifth Marx brother. Like all Marx Brothers shows, no one ever knew what to expect. For example, one night Harpo asked one of the chorus girls to run across the stage in the middle of Groucho's love scene with DeMont. The audience roared and the gag stayed. After Broadway, they took the coconuts on the road, touring until early 1928. But by the time they returned to the Great White Way for Animal Crackers, their third straight hit, show business had been revolutionized. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I am privileged to say a few words to you in this most modern and novel manner. Privileged because it's the first living Vitaphone announcement ever made announcing the coming of one of the year's outstanding pictures. What is the picture? Oh, well, of course. With Talking Movies the latest rage, Paramount, like all studios, was desperate to sign performers who could move and speak at the same time. They snapped up the Marx Brothers. And what's more remarkable to me is that five years after their success on Broadway, they made their first motion pictures. So they got 25 years on stage before you ever see them in coconuts. And by that time, they were all 40 years old. In the spring of 1929, the Marxes made a talky version of the coconuts during the day and performed in the stage production of Animal Crackers at night. Their career couldn't be going any better. And then, tragedy. On September 13, 1929, many Marks died after suffering a stroke. All the boys were there. They were seated around a table. And I have never seen the Marx Brothers as a group that down. I mean, it was like there was a pall over the room. And I was, you know, I was 11 years old, and all I felt was the atmosphere. And I looked at them all, and I quickly got out. It was a terrible moment. Alexander Wolcott wrote, she had done much more than bear her sons, bring them up, and turn them into play actors. She invented them. They were just comics she imagined for her own amusement. They amused no one more. And their reward was her ravishing smile. Six weeks after Minnie's passing, Wall Street crashed. It wiped out what the Marx Brothers, like so many others, had taken years to build. And I think the reason that he was so cautious or tight with his money is that he grew up poor. Then he made a lot of money in show business and then was wiped out in the crash, as many people were, and that terrified him. He said, you know, George, I, I was playing golf. I came off the 18th hole, a rich man, and when I got to the clubhouse, I was destitute. And he never forgot it. Even though he went on to make the money over again and probably more, he never felt secure about the financial situation. And he used to tell us that every night he went to bed, sure that he was going to wake up in the morning wiped out. The Marx Brothers needed money, big money, fast. And the quickest way to get it was by making another picture.
Animal Crackers was a major hit, and as movies were their future, there was only one place to go. Hollywood in the 30s is a town of sunshine, wealth, harebrained antics, and slippery morality. It was this fresh-squeezed environment that greeted the Marx Brothers when they stepped off the train from New York to make their first Hollywood film. business was done at Paramount. And it just so happens at the same time there was another movie being made there called Million Dollar Legs. And there was a young lady by the name of Susan Fleming in that motion picture. And that's how Dad and Susan Fleming met. He very much wanted to ask her out on a date. And he had to summon all this courage up to, to ask her. And when he finally did at the end of the evening, she says, oh, I'd love to, uh, you know, how shall, how shall I dress? And, and uh, dad says, well, I'll wear black tie. So the evening of the date came and she greeted him at her front door in this spectacular turquoise evening gown. And true to his word, he was in black tie. He was also wearing a big black bushy wig, sweatshirt and ballet slippers. And without batting an eye, Susan said, you know, you can always tell a New Yorker by the cut of his clothes. The success of the Marx Brothers was in part testament to their chemistry, on screen and off. The brothers would have normal sibling fights, just like any brothers, about various different uh, things. But they would always come back because the bond was so strong that they would have this wonderful feeling of forgiveness. There wasn't a day that went by that Daddy didn't call Groucho. They had never said anything. I mean, he'd call, he'd say, hi, Grouch, what's new? Grouch obviously would say nothing, and Daddy'd say, fine, bye. I mean, they did this every day, they touched base. Have you read any good books lately? Horse Feathers, the Marx Brothers' fourth film, became their fourth consecutive hit. It also put them on the cover of Time magazine. You might say they adapted to Hollywood success like Ducks to Soup. Fascism was on the rise in Europe, and Duck Soup was filled with satirical jabs at bombastic dictators and their macho warmongering. It was probably the wildest of all their films, and in retrospect, the one that most endeared them to the 60s anti-war generation. Nonetheless, it was not the hit Paramount expected. Just as laughs are the specialty of Harpo, Chico, and Groucho Marx, seen Grauman in the famous forecourt of Grauman's Chinese theater when the comedy clan gathered to be footprinted. So despite their immortalization in the cement outside Grammar's Chinese theater, Paramount decided not to renew their contract. If that wasn't bad enough, Zeppo, tired of juvenile leads that didn't allow him to be funny, quit the act to become a successful Hollywood agent. Once again, it looked like their career might be over. By 1932, network radio was booming. With the deepening depression, audiences were desperately in the need of laughter. Top comedy talent was being lured to the new medium by the promise of big money. Hello, officers, the flywheel just 
Western flywheel. You know, you fellas look just like a couple of stowaways we're looking for. Well, we just heard the opposite. We heard of the stowaways look just like us. One is a little fellow with an Italian accent. Well, it can't be me. No one ever said flywheel was a little fellow with an Italian accent. Much mistake. The reviews were mixed, the ratings low, and the show lasted only 26 weeks. There would be several other broadcast failures, and by the end of the 30s, Groucho and Chico were radio poison. What few know is that in 1934, Harpo became the first American to perform in Russia since the revolution. He braved the brutal winter and tight government security to show the caviar circuit the real meaning of Marxism. In this rare film footage shot by a Russian cameraman, Harpo plays it straight for an obviously appreciative audience. When the Goodwill tour was over, the U.S. ambassador to Moscow enlisted Harpo as a diplomatic courier. He never did learn what secrets were in the envelope strapped to his leg. But in those days when the storm clouds of war were brewing, he was willing to risk his life to help his country. Those same dark clouds were hovering over the career of the brothers Marx. That is until Chico's gambling really paid off. Chico was a bridge partner with Irving Thobard. And Chico said, you know, I, I don't think we're finished. And Irving said, you're not. He said, you've been handled wrong. Chico talked Thalberg, the savvy head of production at MGM, into offering the brothers an incredible deal. Chico came to his brothers and said, Thalberg's giving us a great contract. And Harpo and Groucho said, we're not signing any contract. And Chico said, what do you mean? He said, we're not signing unless you let us manage your money. And so Chico had to give in. But money wasn't the key factor in this deal. Thalberg's eye was on creative excellence. The first thing he did was to reunite them with playwright George S. Kaufman. He said, I'm going to start a whole unit at MGM just for you, with your own writers and your own director. He said, and you'll wait and see. And of course, he was quite right. Yes, with your back to me. When I invite a woman to dinner, I expect her to look at my face. That's the price she has to pay. You check, sir. Nine dollars and forty cents? This is an outrage. If I were you, I wouldn't pay it. Stuart? Ah, come right ahead. Hey, do it. Not the food. You're waiting all that? Food, no. Come on. Come on. You're fired, do you understand? You're fired. Hey, you big bully, what's the idea of hitting that little bully? Will you kindly let me handle my own affairs? Get out. Now, what do you got to say to me? Just this, can you sleep on your stomach with such big buttons on your pajamas? Why, you... Before the cameras could crack a foot of film, the Marx Brothers began to worry about the script, so Thalberg suggested a road tour to test selected scenes. This inspired notion not only improved the script, but rebuilt the brothers' confidence by giving them the chance to do what they did best, perform in front of live audiences. I used to see Groucho and the brothers on the stage of the Golden Gate Theater in San Francisco. They would come up and do scenes from their upcoming movie that they hadn't shot yet. I have never laughed like that in my life in the theater. Not ever. I mean, you, and, I, and I saw four shows a day, seven days a week. And I scream laughing all the time. They would do them in front of this live audience at the Golden Gate Theater and time the laughs so that when they shot the movie, they would, they would leave that much space for the audience to laugh at the movie so you could hear the next joke. As funny as they were in film, they were a hundred times, thousand times funnier on stage. And they were unpredictable. I mean, things would happen on stage that was so wonderful. And I used to watch them wallpaper Margaret Dumont into the wall, you know, four or five shows a day, this poor woman who looked like my mother. During the tour, the famous stateroom scene was almost dropped because it wasn't getting any laughs. Then one night, they threw out the script and Marxist anarchy ruled the stage once more. The results turned a weak scene into a cinema classic. <laughs> 
On the second or third day, uh, I thought to myself, gee, the second show, there's nobody in the audience except a few drunks, guys in overcoats, and a few ladies of the evening. Um, I'll go and get my hair done. So I went out and came back and went backstage, and Daddy and Harper were waiting for me. And I said, hi. And they said, well? And I said, well? And they said, well? And I really didn't know what the hell they were talking about. I looked at Daddy and looked at Harpo, and Harpo said, I told you she wouldn't know. Chico said, I was sure you'd guess. I said, no, what? Guess what? And it turned out they had changed parts. Daddy had played Harpo, and Harpo had played Daddy. And they did it for me, and I wasn't there. That's one of the biggest disappointments I've ever had <laughs> in show business. It was a heartbreak, because they never would do it again. The tour was a rising success, and Thalberg's faith in the Marx Brothers was validated. A Night at the Opera was a box office smash and made them gigantic stars once again. Attempting to repeat the successful formula of A Night at the Opera, the Marx Brothers again hit the road to try out a new script. But two weeks after filming began, Thalberg, only 37 years old, died of pneumonia. Without his guidance during shooting and editing, the brothers had no strong creative vision. Still, Thalberg had set the course, and a day at the races would prove to be the Marx Brothers' last great movie. I got a message from the man of the moon for you. A day at the races enhanced the brothers' fame, and like so many movie stars of the 30s, they began showing up in the most surprising places. Now listen, babe. Have about a few words, see? I've been chasing you all night. Now, how about a little kiss, baby? Well, fancy meeting you here. Those are the red. While it's the blue, he'll have the sin. And nuts to you. No! Objection overruled. You are guilty. Give him a fair trial, and then we'll shoot him. The Marx Brothers were beloved everywhere. Everywhere except at MGM, where without Thalberg, their career stalled. So they went to RKO to make their next film, the only one not written especially for them. It was an awkward fit. Room sir. After room service flopped, the Marx Brothers returned to MGM, which in 1939 released such Academy Award winners as Gone with the Wind and The Wizard of Oz. But Louis B. Mayer was no fan of the brothers, and without a supportive executive to oversee their work, the brothers' interest in movie making waned, and they became unmanageable on the set. The writers who worked on Marx Brothers films all had one thing in common, exhaustion. They were not the easiest people for, for a director to contain. Of course, Groucho 
As he said to me, you know, while my brothers were out chasing girls during the making of these movies, I'm in my dressing room memorizing the lines. Groucho would go in his dressing room, smoke a cigar, study the script, and be there, ready to go to work, and grump a lot. Harpo would be horsing around a little bit, but Chico would be off someplace. He might even be off the stage uh, or in a phone booth someplace phoning in some bets. They had a bet that whoever was late had, was fined. And even Harpo was late once in a great while. And so Harpo and Daddy looked at each other and they said, Groucho is never late. So they went, when he was home, they went to his garage and they fixed it so he couldn't get his car out in the morning. <laughs> He had to take a cab to the studio. And he came there, he was boiling mad. Nobody can outshoot two gun quail. Boy, sweep him out of the gunner. It's just like a movie. important announcement to make. Most important. The Marx Brothers are retiring from the silver screen. Oh, no, 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 no. I, uh, we didn't know you cared. But since you do, we'll present to you songs and scenes from our quite farewell picture, The Big Star, where everything's a good find. Goodbye. Groucho, Chico, and Harpo were now in their 50s. Their last three films were mediocre at best, and MGM no longer wanted them. For that matter, neither did any other studio in town. The brothers, Chico aside, had no financial need to work, so they decided to retire. That's the fine. Let there be wine. And women. And the song. And women. And the caviar. And women. <laughs> The act was finished. Nothing would ever be the same. Not for the Marx Brothers, not for America. Pearl Harbor. The brunt of the cowardly blow struck at Pearl Harbor was borne by the Army and Navy. Harpo did his part for the war effort, crisscrossing the country, selling war bonds with stars such as Lucille Ball and Fred Astaire. Chico formed a big band and toured the country. Chico Marx, his piano, and his orchestra. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Here we are backstage at the Stanley again, and this is yours truly, Ray Spencer, bringing to you for the first time on the air the music of Chico Marx and his new outstanding orchestra. He would be leading the band, and then he would get tired, and his hand sort of would droop, and he would uh, turn his back on the band and sit down and take out a banana and peel it and start to eat the banana. And every so often he would, over his back, he would give a beat to the band. <laughs> Probably didn't do anything to the musicians, but it was very charming. Groucho had built a career on his love of language. Where else could he turn for salvation but back to radio? Come on down, down to the ribbon town, where you down your daily the leading citizen of Blue Ribbon Town, our happy host of hilarious hijinks, Groucho Marx. Oh boy, what a turnout. Isn't this wonderful, Groucho? Wonderful? What's wonderful about it? Where are all the girls? Girls? Did you expect to see girls at a Marine camp? Of course. Where's Marino Sullivan and Marine O'Hara and Marine Dietrich? <laughs> so we're walking down, and on the 11th floor, there was a sign on the door that said, Hamburger and Hamburger Attorneys at Law. Now, this was too good for Groucho to pass up. So he walks in, I followed him in, and he says, I want to say a hamburger. And he always finds the perfect foil seated behind a desk. The lady said, uh, which hamburger did you want to see? And Groucho says, I've always found that one hamburger is pretty much like another hamburger. And she says, well, I really must know which one, he says, the eldest hamburger. 
She said, oh, Hamburger Sr. died last week. He says, really? Well, I'm Groucho Marx. Dig him up. As a traditional radio MC, Groucho sounded stiff and uncomfortable, and listeners stayed away in droves. The show was canceled, and radio's decision makers concluded that Groucho would never be a permanent fixture on the air. With his career on ice, Groucho, like Harpo, turned his attention towards more patriotic endeavors. I think I enjoyed Groucho the most when we did the Victory Caravan back in 1942 when we were selling bonds across the country in about 25, 26 cities. And uh, it was amazing. The train stopped in Washington, which was our first stop, and they had a tremendous crowd cheering everybody that got off the train. And when Groucho got off, nobody recognized him because he didn't have his mustache or cigar. So he just climbed down the other end of the car, put on his mustache, put the cigar in his mouth, got down on the crouch, got off, and got a tremendous hand. And it turned out that in these 30 days of the tour, they sold more war bonds than any other single event ever put on by anybody. The atomic bomb ended the war and brought the troops back home. By the fall of 1945, it was time for all Americans to get back to a normal life. There were families to reunite, lives to rebuild, but could the Marx Brothers find a place in this brave new world? You bet your life. Oh, where have you been? I just announced you wanted you to... You've been backstage? Backstage. Nice. Can you get me one, too? <laughs> And we've got an added starter, Chico Marx. Hey, let an athlete in. Manipulate the uncle. And I'll. <laughs> I'll distract the girl. Tell him Groucho sent you. <laughs> Coming up next, discover everything you didn't know about these silly siblings in The Unknown Marx Brothers Part 2, next on Disney. Tonight, are you tired of bullies who never pick on anyone their own size? Boy, that kid! Well, now you can stay out of trouble the Disney way. First, if someone dives into a mosh pit of mobsters for you, show some respect. The bank is Bill. And I'm Santa Claus. This ain't no tall tale. Then, if the school psycho has your name on file, enlist some hired help. Would you like to make some money to be my bodyguard? But if all else fails, we suggest a good pair of running shoes. So just say back off to bullies tonight on the Magical World of Disney. Movies every night at 7, 6 Central. Disney welcomes TV parental guidelines. A handy way to tell who our shows are for. TVY programs, appropriate for all kids. TVY7 programs, appropriate for kids 7 and above. TVG programs, appropriate for all ages. And TVPG programs, parental guidance suggested. These handy guidelines appear at the beginning of each show. At Disney, we're proud to bring you shows for kids and families to enjoy. Wednesday. It's two Disney stories about something we all take for granted, the power of words. First, imagine if learning was against the law. They will kill you, they find you reading. Would you risk your life for the power of knowledge? Night, John. Then, the true story of a Cambodian girl who escaped to a new country, a new life, and a whole new language. For first place in the 1983 readathon, the winner is Lin Yan. The girl who spelled freedom. Wednesday, it's the magical world of Disney. Movies every night starting at 7, 6 central.
Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. During the next presentation, may I request your absolute silence? Well, I thought my razor was dull until I heard his speech. And that reminds me of a story that's so dirty, I'm ashamed to think of it myself. For I have a message of great importance for everyone in the audience. I implore you, send him back to his father and brothers who are waiting for him with open arms in the penitentiary. I suggest that we give him 10 years in Leavenworth or 11 years in Twelveworth. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take five and ten in Woolworth. Now remember, please, absolute quiet. Cut the cards. The Marx Brothers, Gracho, Chico, and Harpo, were the biggest comedy stars of their time. Irreverent, anti-establishment, unpredictable, they made Depression-era America rock with laughter. But in 1941, the brothers faded into semi-retirement. They continued to work sporadically, but they were really not much more than icons from another time. They were history. of energy and optimism. America was getting back to work, and surprisingly, so were the Marx Brothers. Most people remember the Marxes from their movies. What few know is that they created a substantial body of work in television. That's a high-class Carnegie Hall. You know Allegro Pizzicato? No, I don't. You know Jimmy Pizzicato? <laughs> Maybe you know Itsy Bitsy Pizzicato. None of the Pizzicato. Chico was the first right, to explore this uncharted territory, but it was Groucho who found everlasting stardom in the infant medium. We sat in the audience, and Bob Hope was reading a script, and he was reading it with Groucho. I'd never seen Groucho before in person. And uh, Bob dropped his script accidentally. So Groucho dropped his on purpose. And they talked for maybe 12 minutes or so. And very funny and not dirty. Groucho, what are you doing out here in the desert? Desert? I've been sitting in the dressing room for 40 minutes. <laughs> Groucho, excuse me a minute. I have to make an announcement on the air. Step into the studio with me, will you? All right, you notice everybody in radio wears wooden shoes? So after the show, I went up on the stage and I introduced myself to Groucho and said, um, how would you like to go uh, do a quiz show? And he said, well, I flopped three times on the radio so far. And he had in variety shows. And uh, I'll, try, I'll compete with refrigerators. I'll do anything you want. He said, I would like to do a radio show, but I'll be damned if I do a, a quiz show. That's for idiots. Thank you, thank you. This is Groucho Marx. Well, here I am, stepping in over my head again. Folks, this is just as new to me as it is to you. I've never done one of these shows before, but we've got several couples up here on the stage, a lot of people in the seats out front, and the doors are locked, so I've got to go through with it. <laughs> Besides, somebody might win $1,000 cash at any moment. All I know is it can't be me. You Bet Your Life started on radio in October of 1947 with a format reminiscent of a dozen other quiz shows. But in its second season, it became the sleeper hit of the year and won for Groucho Radio's highest honor, the Peabody Award for Best Entertainer. He saw all his friends succeeding, Jack Benny and this and that, and, and he couldn't, and it really upset him. So when he finally did it himself, it, it made him extremely happy. This I know. The show switched from ABC to CBS just as television was on the way in. But could Groucho make the transition to TV? All right. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the secret word tonight is name. N-A-M-E. Really? You bet your life. And here's that sterling Elgin-American, the one, the only... 
What a ridiculous name. Oh, that's me, Groucho Marx. You're looking at the very first television pictures of Groucho Marx. This audition film was shot in December of 1949 and was never broadcast. We knew we had to be on television eventually, and we wondered how we were going to do that. Would we just televise a radio show? So they decided they'd, they'd bring a camera in and, and on, on CBS, and we did, the, we did the, the show, and during the show, these guys uh, took some pictures of us on kinescope so we could look at it. Suppose I, suppose I kiss her and you didn't know anything about it. Oh, I'd know about it. <laughs> well, I guess I'm going to have to trap you. Um, Howard, I'll bet you a buck. I'll bet you a buck I can kiss your wife and you won't know a thing about it. Bet? Okay, it's a bet. Okay. Would you mind moving aside there? <laughs> Just a moment. Well, you saw me kiss her, didn't you? That's right. I lose. Here's your buck, huh? Oh, that isn't my wife. Well, don't come running to me with your troubles. I... Are, you, are you married? Yes, I am. Do you have any kids? Three and I think four pretty soon. When were you home last? Huh? How'd you lose your job? Well, I was teaching someone how to drive, and I got a ticket for giving the wrong signal. We had quite a talk uh, when we went on television as to whether he should have the little black mustache and the whole thing, you know, like in the movies. And Weezy says, no, you're a different man now. You are not the continuation of that fella. The geniuses at the networks wanted him to do the show with that mustache painted on him and the eyebrows, and he refused. Groucho Marx. And you bet your life. And now, here he is, the one, the only... Is that boy still hanging around? Oh, that's me! Then he even say the secret word, the duck will come down and pay him a hundred dollars. The word tonight is Pepe. That's the way you pronounce it in French. You know? oh. Pepe. Bob Dwan, who later became the director of the Groucho Show, and had been my boss in San Francisco, said, I didn't know you were in town, George. I'm doing an audition, and I'd like you to come down. I, this show may never make it. It's with Groucho. We didn't know there was going to be any great chemistry. I mean, we didn't be able to think, oh, boy, there's a guy that's going to have the chemistry with Groucho. You may fire and run. Uh, you have to ask me. OK. Uh, uh, what do you want me to say? Go ahead. Go ahead, George. <laughs> that's some ad lib, eh? <laughs> But you see, he's so dignified and straight. It's just right for Groucho. And he went to college, and, and uh, Groucho didn't. And it, it was a great luck. That's what it was. All right, uh, you ready? <laughs> we did a, a routine that I didn't, I didn't realize I was doing. I was ad-libbing, but, but in terror. I've been getting a lot of mail recently from people saying that uh, I don't like you and that I ride you on the show and everything. And you know that isn't true, George. You know I love you. <laughs> I didn't know that much. No, huh? no, no. <laughs> if you were a woman, I'd, I'd have snapped you up long ago. <laughs> I just want you to know that, George. Well, I knew that. Um, yes. You did know it? Huh? Yes. I, oh. mean, I knew you liked me oh. uh, in your own way. Uh... <laughs> oh, how that man could embarrass me. And uh, it wasn't that he was really mean, but he could see the dark side of everything, you know. And he would get a lot of fun out of insults. He said to me more than once, was, I, Bob, I have nothing but confidence in you and very little of that. I think one of the reasons he was kind of mean is that he had tight shoes and he had insomnia and he had stomach problems all the time. He couldn't sleep at night, you know. He had a heck of a time. And it made him just kind of ornery. His friend Goodman Ace had, I think, the best retort. He said it was, uh, there was a lot of action in the show, he said. Groucho opened his mouth and literate, witty words came out. Who was the barbarian conqueror known as the Scourge of God? Scourge of God. 
S-C-O-S-C-O-U-R-G-E. Scourge. 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 <laughs> Scrouge of God. What's the difference? They don't know what any of them. They don't know it, and I can't pronounce it. <laughs> It's a real classy quiz show we have. <laughs> we did extensive uh, searching for contestants. We, we found them uh, th through uh, newspaper stories, through letters that were written to us. It was a very popular show, and people wanted to be on it. No, I don't think the people were intimidated by Groucho. Uh, they were proud to be on. The ones I felt sorry for were the contestants who thought they were funnier than Groucho who wanted to do jokes with Groucho. <laughs> and you could see it happening, you know, it just, he'd let him, he'd, he'd, he'd let him go and then, well, oh. <laughs> there, there was actually a little sprinkling of rudeness to what he said, but he was the silly man saying it. What makes you think just because a man is five inches uh, taller than six feet that this makes him a, a man? Well, You know, well. it doesn't go by size. A man's size has nothing to do with his ability in any way. I'm trying to keep this on of a euphemistic <laughs> Well, name one specifically. Well, uh, automobiles couldn't run without felt. Aeroplanes couldn't run. Uh, the girls in California have that new look by this... You uh, mean the girls couldn't run without felt? <laughs> well, I'm a felt and then run. Huh? <laughs> the question is, did Gacha have a script or did he ad lib? And the answer is yes. I don't know why, but people try to prove that our show was scripted. Well, if you if you ever worked with amateurs, um, you know that you don't give them a script the, the night of a show, and they're going to remember. What you want them to remember is when he asks you how you met your husband, tell him that story that you told me. Well, then naturally Groucho will know what that story is going to be, and he's got some ideas of what he's going to say. But it's not a script. The critics raved. Radio TV Daily said, there isn't a comedian in the business that can hold a candle to Brother Groucho's repartee. And therein lies the treat of this new video fair. Only now, upon viewing these recently discovered behind the scenes photographs, does it become clear that Groucho had a little help. We're on film, and, and sometimes Groucho would get off on a tangent that we knew we wouldn't ever use on the show. And we're eating up this film, this 35 millimeter film. So they figured they had to have some way to get a message to him out on the stage. And so what we got, I remembered, was I'd seen him in bowling alleys, you know, that, in which is essentially an overhead projector, which you find in every classroom nowadays. So there was nothing very mysterious about it. It had this white glass with the light behind it, so you could see it. And he, the silhouette, you'd see the words. And he could write backwards and it says, jump to page seven, or ask her where she met her husband. You know, and he would write down this. And, and Groucho, if he looked, he would see, and then he'd ask where she met her husband. And that moved the show along. Well, in what way is your husband romantic, assuming that he is? Which I question. Oh, man, have you ever been made love to by a Frenchman? <laughs> Not that I can recall. <laughs> oh, take him out and pass him around. <laughs> he went to college for that, huh? Keep it this way now, nice and quiet and subdued, huh? All right. <laughs> UCLA, 53. It took 45 minutes to film each episode of You Bet Your Life, after which they would be trimmed down to the best 24 minutes for broadcast. Most of the material that was left on the cutting room floor belonged there. But every so often, a special moment was saved on the editor's outtake reel. You're 30 years old, John? I'm 30. You're what? You're what? I'm 30. You're thirsty? Well, I... <laughs>
we gave him a lot of help. We knew a lot about the contestants when they came up there, and we prepared a lot of material for him, but he was totally free to use that in any way he wanted, and so he could take chances. What have you learned after being 25 years in politics? Well, the old-fashioned way is still the best. <laughs> I must have some reputation, you know. <laughs> there isn't anything anybody can say to me anymore that doesn't evoke some kind of a dirty laugh from the audience. <laughs> what do you mean by the old-fashioned way? <laughs> well, just... And if they didn't work, he knew they would be cut out. He'd turn around to me and say, Clip, 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 here we go again. It was gone. Well, now, suppose you became a famous actress and then you met somebody you liked and got married. Would you be willing to quit acting and be a housewife and a mother? Well, I think if you keep your feet on the ground, you can combine both. That's what I would like to do. Well, if you keep your feet on the ground, you'll never be a mother. <laughs> a waste of film. Primarily, <laughs> the big objective uh, Groucho will be to uh, migrate the people by space vehicle to other planets that have more desirable temperatures. You're going to have to put your shoes on again, you know. <laughs> it is getting deep, ain't it? Yeah. <laughs> Pardon me just a minute. I hate to interrupt this, but uh, have you read this book? No, sir. Well, hold it. I'll be right back. <laughs> Now that we've all seen action, let's have a little action on the show. Before we go on, may I uh, make an announcement here? Well, you may. I don't approve of it, but you can go ahead and make it. Well, this it. is a, a serious announcement for a doctor in our audience. Uh, there's nothing wrong with anybody here at the show. Uh, yeah, hell there is. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Hoyt, uh, uh, one Dr. of the Dr. Hoyt, that's a fine name for a doctor. Dr. Has, Hoyt has a call for you, sir. Doctor, why don't you pay your bills and they won't be <laughs> badgering you in the middle of a performance. Huh? Oh, you're terrible. Yes, I'm not only terrible, but revolting. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers. <laughs> Say, your face looks familiar. Haven't we met before? I don't think so, Groucho. <laughs> and uh, what is your name, miss? No, this is the lady. Oh, I see. <laughs> Either I'll have to get my glasses fixed, or you'll have to do your hair differently. <laughs> what is your name, sir? Uh, Forsythe. Ronald Forsythe. Ronald, huh? <coughs> it was Rodney during rehearsal. <laughs> Okay, now I think we better get started and play You Bet Your Life. Yes. Where's the duck? The, the duck? <laughs> Well, Groucho, in the words of Rufus T. Firefly, wasn't a sentimental old fluff, but this kinescope of his appearance on the Jack Benny program was among his most prized possessions. It hasn't been seen since the original broadcast in 1955. Say the sacred word, which is something found around the house. The duck will come down and pay you $100. Something around the house? Yes. Now, where do you live, uh, Rod? Well, right now, I'm living in Glendale. Glendale. Yeah. Yes, I have a little home there with six rooms and and windows, and window shades, and uh, Venetian blinds, and tables, and chairs, and spoons, and saucers, and dishes, and rugs, and uh, knives, and forks. Hold it, hold it. Why are you telling me all this? Well, you said that the secret word is something around the house. I can't get over how familiar you look. you play a Stradivarius? A stra oh, no, no. You see, I, 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 you, you have to be rich to be able to have a Stradivarius. See, I'm poor. I, all I have around my house are towels and rugs. 
And uh, ashtrays? <laughs> Look, enough of that already. Now, Rodney, you say you, you don't have a Stradivarius? No, sir. You know, I heard that a lot of imitation Strads have been made and sold. I know, but they could never fool me because, you see, I, I could tell a phony. I get it! I guess the word. Hold it, hold it, hold it. It's been a mistake. The duck thought you said the secret way, but you didn't. What? Secret way is telephone, and you said telephony. Yeah, but I got an impediment in my speech. I always say that. I say telephony. I say yes, telephony. Well, I shave. I use, I use cologne. I say it all the time. You use cologne when yes. you shave? Yes. Well, in the sentence you used, you said you wouldn't be fooled because you could telephony. Well, you didn't let me finish the sentence. I said, I was going to telephony a friend of mine who's a violin expert. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> What's his name, this friend? <laughs> You've got a friend. Well, okay, they say the customer's all right, but I don't know how that applies to you. You sound like the type who's never been a customer. I don't care. Just let me at this duck. So. <laughs> there must be more where that came from. Well, there was, but he just flew in from Las Vegas. Benny is not, although he's a funny ad libber, he does it with attitude. I mean, he does it with a facial expression and gets, you know, tremendous laughs. The big question tonight is $3,000. <laughs> now, you have 15 seconds to decide. <laughs> you have 15 seconds to decide on a single answer between you. Think carefully and please don't help in the audience. Are you ready? Yeah. yeah. All right, there's a famous radio and television comedian who was born in Waukegan, Illinois. Jack Benny! Jack Benny! Jack Benny! Jack Benny! I got it! Jack Benny! Jack Benny! I know it! Jack Benny! Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We know it's Jack Benny, Mr. Forsythe, but that's not the question. What? The question is this. Now listen. This is the question. For many years, this bum has been lying about his age. Now, for $3,000... <laughs> $3,000, can you tell me how old he really is? <laughs> Only got five seconds more. $3,000, what is Jack Benny's real age? 39. I'm sorry, but that's the wrong answer, which means the big question next week will be worth $3,500. Thanks and good luck in the DeSoto Plymouth Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye, Rodney. <laughs> so anybody that can give away as much money as you do and still tell jokes deserves something. <laughs> Jack, that's an unfortunate subject, you, but since you did bring it up, uh, yeah. when do I get paid? How about money? Oh, 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 well, Groucho, I wouldn't worry about that because you will get a check tomorrow morning. Mm. Now, how about paying me in cash? <laughs> Why, what's, what's wrong with my check? Well, I can telephone you, too. Can I? <laughs> you bet your life entered this remarkable run in 1961. The real secret word was spontaneity. That's what made the show unique. You never knew what Groucho would say next. That edge gave the program life and syndication, where it has influenced each new generation of comedians. The program revived Groucho's career and made him a bigger star than ever, and paved the way for a Marx Brothers renaissance. On that, you can bet your life. Back in 1946, just before Groucho fell into his newfound stardom, he was enjoying semi-retirement. He was a frustrated farmer, and he was constantly out in the backyard pruning the trees and tending to the, the vegetable gardens. He loved doing that. Here in these never-before-seen 3D home movies, Groucho relaxes with his family. Harpo, no longer the jaunty world-traveling member of the Algonquin Roundtable, had retired to more sedate pleasures. 
Chico, however, no thanks to his compulsive gambling, was still in debt. So he prevailed upon his reluctant brothers to make another movie. Now, I'm not saying that they didn't get angry at Daddy. They did because of the gambling. But even, even with the anger and the rage and the yelling and, you know, about, I'm not going to give you another dime, they always ended up bailing him out. They're back, the Marx Brothers. Groucho, Harpo, Chico. That's to me. Go on, boss. Tell him about it a bit. I, I can't, Chico. There's too much noise. I think. Be a night in Casablanca. A Night in Casablanca was hardly vintage Marx Brothers, except when compared to the last film, Love Happy. Actually, Love Happy was conceived by Harpo as a solo vehicle, but Chico talked his way into the movie, and when production funds ran out, investors would not put up additional money unless Groucho made an appearance. Love Happy is really noteworthy for only one thing, Groucho, King Lear himself, playing opposite a young Marilyn Monroe. And now, gambling debts or no, the Marx Brothers' film career really was over. While Groucho was busy revolutionizing the quiz show, Chico took his act overseas. Chico, what do you think of England? Oh, I like England very much. I hope England's going to like me. Tell me something. Do you talk like that all the time? No, I talk like this in the pictures. You see, I used to be... Uh, in the world, I used to be always Italian, but I saw what they did to Mussolini, so now I'm Greek. Excuse me. <laughs> Harpo, meanwhile, pursued his diverse interests, including posing for Hollywood's favorite portrait artist, John Decker. In these rare home movies, he's seen clowning in front of Decker's Harpo as the Blue Boy. Susan and Harpo ultimately got married and they decided it was absolutely necessary that they have a family. And the house that they lived in had four windows, two on the second story, two on the first story. And it was dad's dream that when he came home at night, he would see a smiling face in each one of those windows. So hence came Billy then Alex, then Minnie, and then Jimmy. And his dream was realized. I have two Marx brothers of my own and a Marx sister. My father would sometimes be listening to the radio, and they had a show in Palm Springs where people would come on about lost animals, lost pets, that they had found animals. And my father would generally answer the, the radio ad and bring that animal home. And we were always, the house was always filled with animals. He loved animals. As much as Harpo enjoyed spending time with his family, he wasn't ready to retire, not yet. Later, somebody out of the audience would start shooting back at us. You know that. I believe that my dad was apprehensive every time he walked out on the stage. Oh, you want me to do a different type show? Is that it? Huh? Well, maybe I better humor this kid. Let's walk on back into my office. Will you come back here, huh? Come on back. Here we are. Well, you like that, huh? <laughs> he was very nervous that night. Because in those days, it was live television and you only had one shot at it. This was no editing. And he recognized that. And this was not rehearsed heavily to the point where it would be smooth. And he knew that. A windshield wiper. <laughs> Yeah, more, oh, more, this is great. A windshield wiper on a rainy day. <laughs> Nobody ever knew how to write for Harpo. He went to page two, and it says Harpo skips down a nice little road, and he is confronted by a huge stuffed bear. Harpo does something funny. That's how they wrote for him. Come on, I asked you to play the hop. Will you play the hop? You won't play the hop? 
You don't want it? Why? <laughs> want to play another instrument? <laughs> this, <laughs> this is yours? <laughs> yours? Yeah. You, you invented this? Oh, good. It's very peculiar. Fine. It's got two mouthpieces, huh? You play in both sides at the same time? <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> Listen, would you please do me a favor? And I'd like you to play the harp. Would you play the harp? You don't want to play the harp? You have another instrument to play? Oh, I'll wait, I'll wait. What are you going to get? Oh, you're going to get the clarinet. I didn't know he played. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to watch Harper play the clarinet. He's really one of the greatest. <laughs> you going to play the clarinet? Not seriously. What are you going to play? What are you going to play? I'm forever blowing bubbles. That's why. You're going to play it seriously? Well, if you're going to play it seriously, I'll direct the band seriously, because I'm a great musical conductor. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to play the number or not? Now stop it! Finish the number, will you, Harpo, please? trouble what's the trouble don't you want me to play don't you want me to direct it you want another director who do you want who do you want i would oh belly may billy may <laughs> billy may all right billy would you come over here please i want you to meet hoppo marks oh, uh, have you got a suggestion can you help us can you help us yes i have a great suggestion milton what he plays yeah i direct yeah. and you sing i thought you'd never call on me i'm a great singer i'm a sensational singer <laughs> Blowing bubbles, pretty bubbles in the air. Oh, they, they did you really wrote it, did you? And just like my dreams, they fade and I'll take it now. felt that the roles outside of Harpo were the most difficult to play. In 1925, he was in a movie called Too Many Kisses. Then later on, he went to play Summer Stock. He did The Man Who Came to Dinner. And later on, he played uh, The Yellow Jacket with Alexander Wolcott. And in the early 1960s, he appeared on television in another dramatic role with you, Mac. Hey, ain't this the guy? You know, you, you know the deaf mute. The d description fits. Yeah, it must be. Hey, look, I got some fares in the cab. Let me take them, will you? Sure, go ahead. Come All on, right, let's take it easy, it up, yeah. Come on. Come on, it's all over. Look, there's an all-points bulletin out for you. Come on, let's stop playing around, Alan. Hey, boy, you sure see some dandies, huh? I'm not trying to run. Well, look, I didn't take any course in mind reading at the police academy. Let's go, huh? Come on. Hey, wait a minute. For Pete's sake, what do you want? Except for those occasional guest spots, Harpo spent his time in Palm Springs playing golf and being a good father and husband. So, to make it simplified, we moved down here. Vinny, 
What, what do you like most about living in Palm Springs? Well, I love horseback riding, and in Beverly Hills, you couldn't do much horseback riding. So I, have, I do have a horse of my own. My father never really wanted any of us to go into show business. He didn't push it. If we wanted to, I'm not sure he would have discouraged us. But it was something he really didn't push. I know you helped your father with his music, uh, but do you intend to make show business your career? Yes, uh, Mr. Murrow, I'm very interested in the music field. And they brought in all these cameras and all these wires, and they set up, and they rehearsed the show, and it was a remarkable performance because they went all over the grounds of El Rancho Harpo while doing this 20-minute segment with Edward R. Murrow, and it was all live and it was all spontaneous, and it was wonderful. Harpo, I would gather that we're in your trophy room. Did you win them all? <laughs> Harpo was my favorite uncle because he was an absolutely wonderful man. He was a sweet, caring, gentle soul, just the way he appeared. In the movies, he he was just a, a wonderfully kind man, and uh, and he was he was a comfortable person to be around. He and his whole family. I can remember my father coming and waking me up in the middle of the night, very often, because he wanted to play a game. He wanted to play jacks. Uh, he wanted to play cards, any kind of a game. But if he was working during the daytime, nighttime was the only time he had to spend with his children. And it would never occur to him to let us sleep. He would just come wake us up, and that was his time to play a game or whatever. My parents were having a lot of problems. My mother was uh, drinking, and, and off. And Harpo and his family lived six or seven blocks away when I was growing up in Beverly Hills. And many the evening that I would bicycle over to Harpo's house, there was a peacefulness there that there was not in my house, and I would always bicycle over in time for, for them to invite me to dinner and hope that they would, and they frequently did. They, mo they always did. Hello, Harpo. You are Harpo, aren't you? And you live in Beverly Hills. You like Beverly Hills? Oh, you don't talk. Oh, I see. You talk to your family. Where, where is your family? Where are the kids? Oh, there's uh, Minnie. Any more? There's Jimmy. Any more? And there's Alex. <laughs> well, you know, I can't wait to see Mrs. Marks. I wonder if she's going to have a wig. Oh, there she is. The most important lesson, I suppose, that Dad taught all of us kids was that whatever you do in your life, enjoy doing it. That what you do isn't as important is how you feel about yourself while you're doing it. We always had family days where the whole family was together. Groucho, Chico, Zeppo, and Gummo, we were all together. And family was very important to him. Tell us, uh, does he ever talk? Can't you get anything out of him? Never have. Try it, will you? Well, the kids must know what their daddy says. Alex, do you know what your daddy said? <laughs> oh, you see your famous brothers very often? Oh, very often. It's a very close family. Yeah. Where, <laughs> where's Groucho right now? He's probably floating around Beverly Hills. He loves to walk. This is one of the busiest streets in Beverly Hills. It isn't really a street. It's a cheap set. <laughs> but I love this cheap set. <laughs> For a spectacular, it didn't have to be this cheap. <laughs> oh, hello, little girl. Who are you? I'm your daughter, Melinda. Oh, Melinda, my little tax exemption. How are you? <laughs> what are you doing here? You on your way home? No, I'm going to hear Tony Martin sing in a minute. Tony Martin? Wouldn't you rather hear me sing? No, Daddy, I've heard you sing. Well, would you consider doing a duet with me? All right. I've always tried to be a good daughter. Well, hop right up here. Yes, I can. Yes, no, you can. Yes, I can. Yes, no, you can. No, you can. No, you can. Anything you can be, I can be greater. Soon I'll be 
my brother. I don't think I got your name. No, I got my name. I think you're pulling my leg. Yeah, just to get him even. Well, would you mind helping me push this camera store around? <laughs> I'm sorry. I gotta go to the golf course and lay down in the sand trap. Sand trap? Yeah, you see, it's a Sunday, and that's when I see my psychiatrist. <laughs> I'm sure I used to know him. If I'm not mistaken, we both had the same mother. He was berating Groucho for something and I said to him, well, you know, Pop, I said, you have to realize that Groucho's always been jealous of you because of Grandma. And Daddy said, what do you mean? I said, well, weren't you Grandma's favorite? He said, well, yeah. I said, well, don't you think Groucho was jealous? He said, you know, I never thought of that. He was very jealous of Chico, and this lasted all the way up through his uh, manhood. And another thing, Chico always got the girls. And uh, this was a source of aggravation to Groucho, too. Joe, you know uh, that gypsy love song? Well, I know the chorus. Well, I played the voice. Maybe you could follow me, huh? Well, suppose you play the voice while I noodle around. You're going to noodle? Uh-huh. What do you mean by noodle? <laughs> All right, it's fine. You noodle there, and I'll macaroni over here. <laughs> Now we try the chorus, but the chorus we play pianissimo. Uh, you know what pianissimo is, Joe? Oh, no. How long do you study music? Oh, about 15 years. You know, two more years you could have been a plumber? <laughs> Why you scare my wife, huh? Me? Yes, for me. No, I mean you. I'm a telephone Unlike man. his brothers, television was never a medium on which Chico thrived. Papa Romani, an episode of a 1950 anthology series, was an early misstep. He was not a good dialectician. I mean, even his Italian rest, accent sort of slipped a lot. We used to say, Chico, your accent is slipping. Then came and went the College Bowl, a musical variety series in which he played the operator of a campus ice cream shop. Of course, there were bad things because he was a compulsive gambler. I mean, that's what almost all the fights in the house were. My mother lived in... She wouldn't buy a house for many years because she said she didn't want to wake up in the morning and find out that some gangster owned it. Chico was an inveterate gambler, and it caused the Marx Brothers great grief because they constantly had to bail him out financially. This is my family album. And this to my brother Harpo. He's always chasing the girls. But no more. Now he's a tell of the girls about creamy prom. Because prom home permanent is a waving cream. Leaves your hair sauce. You get a creamy prom. Right, Harpo? He was a combination of a will-o'-the-wisp and Peter Pan. And to a little girl, he was magic. First appearance on British television. <laughs> Chico, um, can I ask the obvious question? You're going to play the piano for us, aren't you? Yes, but uh, I'm a little busy right now. Busy stage. What do you mean backstage? <laughs> no. What here? Yeah. Can you get one for me? I got it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. When my uncle Chico would sit with me at the piano, sometimes he would help me on the pieces that I was supposed to be playing. 
because my mother was always sitting and listening in the other room. But he would always entertain me because he had a style all his own. I was more entertained uh, by his piano playing than what I was supposed to be doing. be driving up any street and he'd say you see the green light baby and I'd say yes he said daddy bets you that it'll turn red before you can count ten <laughs> they had to have a bet going on everything hey you don't look like an old angel disguise yourself no no put on your halo 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 not the hello your halo you watch you're looking at the Deputy Seraph, a television pilot about muddling angels writing earthbound wrongs. These scenes, pieced together from the recently discovered master film footage, are all that remain of the legendary, lost, Marx Brothers TV show. Did you ever see a worse looking pair of angels? Say the secret word and you can have either one of them. 24 Chicago, take one. Baker, take three. Hey, pipe it down. Here comes the chief. One. Action. It's a easy. Now, don't be scared. All you got to do is a sneak in a side of this a sneaky fellow. Now, go ahead. Now, do your stuff. A fine pair of bunglers. A jealous woman. She'll get even with him. She'll marry him. I'll have to take charge here. Phone, please. Hmm. I wonder how they do that. Hello? Okay. Three. Take four. Take four. You mean the full treatment on the dialect now and really punch it. Go. He's a piano player. I'm a piano player. I fix him. Start again and say, look. <coughs> oh. Look. He's a piano player. I'm a piano player. I fix a him. Freeze! Go into action. Where is he going? Where is he? That's good. Step out. Walk. Phone, please. Hmm. I must find out how they do that. Roger. Chico. I'll take the easy way. Phone, please. Extraordinary. No. It was the first time all three brothers had worked together in nearly a decade, but it wasn't a happy experience. Throughout the filming, Chico frustrated everyone with his inability to remember lines. Then, during a break in shooting, it was discovered that he was suffering from hardening of the arteries. No insurance company would underwrite the rigorous schedule of a weekly series, so production was shut down, and The Deputy Seraph was never completed. Hey! And he was beginning to get very ill at that time, and it was hard from then on. Despite his illness, Chico kept working. He starred in Summer Stock, and with Harpo, entertained Las Vegas audiences with a nightclub act. I had uh, just split from my husband and was having a hard time financially, and uh, I was talking to Daddy about it, and he said, gee, he said, I wish I were Groucho so I could help you. And I said, and I'm so glad I said it, I said, I wouldn't trade you in for any of my uncles. I said, you're the best in the world. I've been always so happy that I said that to him. Anyway, he was getting sicker and sicker. And we knew it was only a matter of time. And he had a near, near brush, I mean, my mother had me fly out because we thought he was dying. And, but he recovered from that attack. Well, they'd lived through so many near deaths with Daddy that I think when he finally died, they just were sort of relieved because he was very, very ill. So when that happens, it's kind of a relief. 
Jimmy Durante at the funeral looked awful. And I heard him say, it's the end of it. There'll be no more Marx Brothers. Well, now, Harpo speaks in this fascinating new autobiography, that is. In, in person, that's another question. Let's find out. Harpo, uh, your book is chock full of great and very funny stories. Now, which one is your favorite? going on, they started whooping too. We heaved. <laughs> we heaved everything we could get our hands on into the office pit. <laughs> the piano player surrendered. <laughs> I think it was the Stonewall Jackson. <laughs> I don't remember much about the rest of the performance. <laughs> it can't be that cold in here. <laughs> he loved music, and he played the harp every single day of his life. And the, probably the most important moment of his stage life would always come when he would sit down to play solo harp. And that's when you saw Harpo transform himself into the serious Arthur Marx. And all of a sudden he would be at, at one with the harp. In the late 30s, Salvador Dali, the great surrealist painter, dubbed the Marx Brothers as being the great surrealist act. He gave my dad a harp that had strings of barbed wire and it was wrapped in cellophane and there were spoons and knives and forks glued to the entire frame. During one of my dad's many semi-retirements, Gummo came to him with a deal. It was to do four one-minute commercials for Labatt's beer. Harpo, what would you like most in all the world right now? No, not that, not that. Imagine it's hot. The sun's beating down on you. Imagine you're in the middle of a burning desert, a hundred miles from the nearest oasis. You haven't had a drink of water in three days. Now, what do you want most in all the world? Arpo, didn't anyone tell you this is a beer commercial? That's right, you've got it. Labatt's Pilsner Lager Beer. They were the most surrealistic commercials I've ever seen in my life. Arpo. Imagine we're lost, drifting in the middle of the Pacific, surrounded by man-eating sharks. No food, no water, no hope. Then suddenly we sight land. We're rescued, saved from a fate worse than death. Now, what's the first thing you'd ask for? My dad jumped at it because uh, he was able to make some money and it would be just one day of shooting. Round one, you moved into the center of the ring. You sized him up. Then you hit him. You changed your tactics. You're trying to confuse him. You're laughing at him, trying to make him mad. What happened? Ooh, don't tell me. He got mad. Never mind, Harpo. You'll do better in the next round. And n n to this day, I don't understand him, but I find them most fascinating. I'm not sure my father really wanted to retire. Show business had been his life, and I think that's what he wanted to continue doing until he couldn't do it any longer. The entire Marx clan gathered for Harpo's final performance. He shared the bill with Red Hot Comedy folk singer Alan Sherman. Just about the end of the first half of the show, Alan stepped to the microphone and said, this is a very special evening because you folks are going to witness the retirement of Harpo Marx. And all of us went, oh, you know, when we heard that shocking news, and then Alan said something like, 
I don't even know if he'll come out, but I'm going to ask this great gentleman and great comedian if he will come out and let us applaud him once more, something to that effect. Well, Harpo came out and he got a standing ovation again, first of all, because we did love him, and secondly, we thought we'll never see him again. And then remember, Dad got up and made a speech for the first time, spoke in public. It was a very interesting feeling because here is a man who was silent all his life and making people laugh, and now he was speaking and everybody was silent. And then a, a chuckle originally built to a roar of laughter over the next six or seven minutes because once he started to speak, you couldn't shut him up. <laughs> Here is Hoppo really at work. around that this is Britain's revenge for the Boston Tea Party. 3,000 screaming teenagers are at New York's Kennedy Airport to greet, you guessed it, the Beatles. This rock and roll group has taken over as the kingpin... 1964, Beatlemania triggered a cultural revolution. Some music critics call their harmony unmistakably diatonic. Others say it's pandiatonic. When John, Paul, George, and Ringo exploded on the scene, some observers compared their Liverpudlian wit to that of the Marx Brothers. So it really shouldn't have been surprising that rebellious teenagers embraced the subversive comedy of the Marx Brothers and made them anti-establishment heroes. Their films were rediscovered and became regular attractions on college campuses. In fact, the popularity of the brothers' films soared all over the world, from Stockholm to Tokyo. Over a half century after they first set foot on stage, the Marx Brothers were reborn as international superstars. Groucho's irreverence matched the spirit of the times, and he found himself in constant demand. His remarkable renaissance culminated in the classic An Evening with Groucho at New York's fabled Carnegie Hall. The show was recorded for an album and became a bestseller. Right now, he's one of the hottest new concert attractions in the world. And he did it all with two eyebrows. Freak. Boink. <laughs> Mustache, smarget, <laughs> horn room glasses, Norfolk Smith, cigar almost as big as he was, <laughs> and the world's most imitated walk. <laughs> oh, there I am. Now say the secret, Wade, and a duck will come down and give you $50. We all were big, big fans of Groucho. And we said, uh, would it be possible to get him to do a show? Because at that point, Groucho wasn't working. So we said, hey, let's ask him. So I called him at the house, and uh, we had a long talk. He hit me up for a lot of money, and we negotiated. And then I said, OK, Groucho, I'll call you Tuesday. And he said, you can call me whatever you wish, but that is my name. So I said, Whew, OK. <laughs> and now, here is my special guest star, Rufus T. Firefly, J. Cleaver Loophole, Dr. Hugo Z. Heckenbush, Captain Jeffrey Spaulding, also known as Mr. Groucho Marx, ladies and gentlemen. In 1973, when he was almost 83, Groucho made his last great variety show appearance. Proving that the master's wit was as sharp as ever, Groucho traded quips with one of comedy's biggest stars. Oh, it's you. Oh, yes. 
Yes, how are you, Doctor? Fine. Nice fine. to see you. Yeah. You look... Uh, have, have a sit down. Oh, I'll be glad to. How have you been? I've just been fine. Well, what are we going to do now? I don't know, but I'm just tickled to have you here, and words cannot express how thrilled I am to have you on the show. A little money wouldn't hurt either. <laughs> All right. Now. You smoke cigars, I see, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I like them. Good ones? Yeah, well, it just mostly comes from the first time I saw you, and I figured, gee whiz, you know, I would like to smoke cigars. Well, uh, you know, it's, it's a handy thing to have for a comedian. Assuming you are a comedian. <laughs> there's, there's one question I wanted to ask you. You've known all of the truly great names in comedy. Now, I mean, how would you classify me? You? Yeah. You'd come right after Nixon. <laughs> and so would I if I had a chance. <laughs> Look, every one of those jokes in that session worked. Uh, uh, because he would... Uh, he would listen to the question, and then that mind would click in. Okay, how would you rate W.C. Fields? I never speak ill of the dead. <laughs> Except in your case. When I met Groucho, I found exactly what I expected. A cantankerous, ornery, salty, amusing, amazing man who took nothing seriously. Do you believe in life after death? I have serious doubts about the life before death. <laughs> the way we're going now. <laughs> I believe in death during life. And so does everyone watching this show. Do you have any unfulfilled wish? Well, yes, I'd like to terminate this interview as soon as <laughs> Well, you can't be funnier than that. Of course, it put Cosby down and put Cosby away because uh, everybody had great respect for Cosby at that point, except for Groucho, who had none. And he didn't, he didn't respect Bill. He bo it bothered uh, Groucho that Bill smoked better cigars than, than Groucho did. So Groucho, on the way out, copped about a half a dozen of Bill's cigars. <laughs> and and I, you just you had to love him. In 1974, Groucho was presented with an honorary Oscar for his contribution to film. He began this final moment in the spotlight by taking a bow for all the Marx Brothers. Hello, I must be going. I cannot stay, I came to say I must be going. I'm glad I came, but just the same, I must be going. I'll stay a week or two. I'll stay the